Unfortunately, Crystal was a vulnerable person and someone took advantage of that. Tonight, new information has been released for a historical cold case in Manitoba. That's the kind of services I think that are required to support and even help you know, people become bitter. Plus, an inquiry into the child protective services in Labrador has wrapped up. She gets fatigued incredibly quickly, um, even walking up and down the stairs in her home. And the widow of a Métis man killed four years ago has another tragedy happen to her and her family. Good evening and welcome to APTN National News. I'm Savannah Kelly. RCMP major crime services in Manitoba have released new information in a historical homicide investigation dating back to 2007. A man has been charged in connection with the death of 26-year-old Crystal Saunders, a Métis woman from Winnipeg. Tamara Pimentel has more. It's been almost 17 years since Crystal Saunders went missing from Winnipeg and found dead near St. Ambrose, Manitoba a day later. On Friday, RCMP arrested Kevin Q in Vancouver and charged him with second-degree murder for Saunders' death. Crystal was a mother, she was a daughter, and a friend to many that needlessly lost her life to violent crime. Crystal also struggled. She was exploited and had issues with addictions. Unfortunately, Crystal was a vulnerable person and someone took advantage of that. In April 2007, Saunders was last seen by an on-duty Winnipeg police officer in Winnipeg's West End. The next morning, she was found by an off-duty RCMP officer who was checking his trap line. DNA evidence led to Q's arrest. MMIW advocate Sandra um, Delarond credits Project Devote, a team happened. of investigators from Winnipeg Police and Manitoba RCMP. It is such good news for the family and for our community that uh, Project Devote works and uh, it's an important part for uh, families and communities in resolving cases in this province. Delarond says the news about Saunders really brings closure and hope to Indigenous communities in Manitoba. Tamara Pimentel, APTN National News, Winnipeg. Still in Winnipeg, a First Nations man is dead after an interaction with the Winnipeg Police Service early Saturday morning saw him become unresponsive. A warning to viewers, the following video may be distressing. 35-year-old James Wood appears to be unresponsive as Winnipeg police carry him to a cruiser in this video captured by a bystander. According to WPS, police were called just after midnight Saturday morning by Wood's girlfriend. She said he was intoxicated and that she was worried for her children's safety. Minutes later, another caller from the complex said Wood was collapsed outside in the parking lot. Police arrived soon after and restrained the man. Other media are quoting eyewitnesses who say the man may have been tasered by police. After becoming unresponsive, he was taken to hospital where he died later that day. WPS Chief Danny Smythe says the Independent Investigation Unit of Manitoba is investigating. Certainly we are aware that things can occur or be captured in little snippets online and a whole narrative could take off without anybody really knowing what occurred. Um, I think it's important that we try to provide some context, but also respecting the fact that IAU still has to investigate it. So it's a balancing act between trying to provide enough information to the public, but respecting the integrity of the investigation. Bradley Barton has lost his appeal for a new trial for his manslaughter conviction in 2021 for the murder of a Cree Métis woman. The Alberta Court of Appeals decision was unanimous as it upheld Barton's 12 and a half year sentence in the 2011 death of Cindy Gladue in an Edmonton hotel. Gladue bled to death after a sexual encounter with Barton. In a statement, Gladue's family says they are deeply relieved with the decision and are asking for privacy. Cindy's mother, Donna McLeod, hopes her daughter's spirit will now be able to rest because of this ruling. Today begins week three of the inquest into the stabbings on James Smith Cree Nation and in the nearby village of Weldon. Today, we heard from the Parole Board of Canada. Reporter Rachel May has more. 
Monica Irfin with the Parole Board of Canada took the stand this morning to explain why Miles Sanderson was not in prison when he killed 11 people and injured another 17 in September 2022. Irfin said that the Parole Board of Canada considered Sanderson an excessive risk, but added conditions to his release, which he would later breach. He was supposed to abstain from drugs and alcohol, having relationships with women approved, and not associating with people consuming substances or committing crimes. Despite a recommendation that Sanderson be returned to prison, the parole board released him again, stating that his risk was being managed with his conditions. Kim Bowden is National Vice Chief of the Congress of Aboriginal Peoples. He's been observing the inquest. He says jury recommendations can make a difference. They can make a difference in terms of um, like policy, policy changes, for example, within corrections would be a big one. Bowden says that the system needs to follow through on the jury's recommendations, unlike in previous inquests. A lot of times when, when there's recommendations, they tend not to be followed. Two elders with Correctional Services Canada spoke today about Sanderson's involvement with cultural practices and his healing plan to address his anger issues prior to release. The inquest is expected to wrap up tomorrow, but could possibly go later into the week. Rachel May, ABTN National News, Melford, Saskatchewan. A family that suffered the loss of their husband and father is now facing another crisis. Sarah Sansom's husband, Jacob Sansom, and his uncle were shot and killed four years ago. Now their 16-year-old daughter has been diagnosed with a degenerative disease that will leave her in a wheelchair. ABTN's Chris Stewart spoke with Sarah on how she's dealing with this devastating news. In March of 2020, Jacob Sansom and his uncle Maurice Cardinal lost their lives in rural Alberta. The two Métis men were hunting when an altercation with two men, Roger Bilodeau and his son, Anthony Bilodeau, ended with both Jacob and Maurice being shot and left to die. Both Roger and Anthony Bilodeau are in prison for their deaths. It was a huge blow to the close-knit Sansom family, whose lives were forever changed. Now, more pain for Sarah Sampson, Jacob Sampson's widow, and her kids. Their oldest daughter, 16-year-old Sierra, has been diagnosed with Friedrich's ataxia, it is an incurable degenerative disease that damages the spine, nerves, and parts of the brain. It affects people's ability to walk, can cause vision and hearing loss, affects speech, and can damage the heart. Sarah says Sierra has been showing signs for almost a decade that doctors could not find a diagnosis. And after Jacob's death, she says her deterioration quickened. Before he died, she was still able to dance. She was still, still able to... Um, uh, ride a bike. Um, over the last few years, it's to the point where she cannot walk half a block. She falls over very easily. She loses her balance. She gets fatigued incredibly quickly, um, even walking up and down the stairs in her home. The condition will have her in a wheelchair in her 20s, and currently there is no known cure. Knowing she's never going to dance again, knowing she's never going to ride a bike. Um, her dreams of being a biologist in Australia. And she can't do those things anymore. But to help her stay mobile now, the family have ordered a wheelchair and it will arrive in the next six weeks. She's a pretty strong kid. You know, she, you know, asking how she's doing about it. Her biggest thing is um, she cannot wait for this wheelchair so that she can hang out with her friends again. She can go to the mall, she can go to the zoo, she can actually be mobile. A friend of Jacob's created a GoFundMe to help the now single mother and widow pay the bills. She works two jobs to keep the lights on. Her doctor advised her to quit at least one. Already with the two jobs and all, my, and all the hours I'm able to work, now I'm barely making ends meet. And if I have to quit even or even cut down hours, it's, it's, it's going to make it so I can't make ends meet. Donations have been coming in, but not nearly enough to help long term. She is asking for the public's help. With all these appointments and everything, and I'm already exhausted. I'm done. Like I'm, I'm like, how am I going to continue to work two jobs, take time off at both jobs for all these appointments, court, everything else? Because I still have court. We still have appeals. We still have parole board hearings. Sarah says any donation amount helps. Chris Stewart, APTN National News, Calgary. We want to hear what you think about this story or any other story you see here tonight. Here's how to continue the conversation. 
If you have a story you want to share, send us an email to news at aptn.ca. To read and watch our stories, go to aptnnews.ca. You can find us online on your favorite social media sites, including TikTok, YouTube, LinkedIn, and X, previously known as Twitter. Follow APTN News to join the conversation and see our latest stories. We need to take a short break. Coming up, a new warming center in Whitehorse is hoping to keep vulnerable people out of the cold this winter. Plus, an inquiry into the experiences and treatment of Innu children in care wraps up in Labrador. And I know utilizing and working with people on land, utilizing your own culture, your own positive things, you will get more rewards, more positive in terms of when we talk about prevention. Welcome back to APTN National News. Politicians got back to work in Ottawa on Monday as Parliament resumed sitting. With an election likely a little over a year away and the Liberals continuing to trail the Conservatives by double digits in the polls, expect this to be a raucous session. APTN's Fraser Needham has more. After a rough few years dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic, rising inflation and skyrocketing housing prices, it is clear the Trudeau government would like to hit the reset button and convince Canadians sunny times are back. That was the theme during a press conference held by Deputy Prime Minister Krista Freeland. Inflation is now down to 3.4% and that is down from its peak of 8.1%. Wage growth has now outpaced inflation for 11 months in a row and private sector economists predict that Canada will avoid the recession that many had thought was inevitable. But in Monday's question period, opposition Conservative leader Pierre Polyev was having none of it, accusing the government and Prime Minister of being completely out of touch. Meanwhile, Canadians in Edmonton are facing, were facing minus 50 degree temperatures on which they were paying carbon taxes just to, to heat their homes and stay alive. Given that he gives himself a free vacation at other people's expense, will he at least allow Canadians to heat their homes without his tax? NDP leader Jagmeet Singh was saying much the same, alleging the Liberals continue to stand idly by as homeless situations in Edmonton and Toronto spiral out of control. This Liberal government doesn't care either. They have been in power for nine years and they don't get it. The Prime Minister doesn't get it. The Liberal Minister for Edmonton doesn't get it. And the 24 Liberal MPs in Toronto don't get it. Why does this government wait until things are at a breaking point before acting? The government will continue to work on a number of pieces of legislation that affect Indigenous people in the upcoming sitting. These include a controversial act that recognizes Métis governments in Alberta, Saskatchewan and Ontario. An act that establishes a national council to oversee the government's progress on reconciliation. And the First Nations Clean Water Act. Fraser Needham, AP10 National News, Ottawa. The Canadian Association of Journalists says the arrest of an award-winning First Nations journalist in Edmonton is an abomination. The CAJ and others held a press conference today calling for the immediate dismissal of charges against Brandy Morin. On January 10th, Morin was arrested by the Edmonton police while reporting on a raid at a primarily Indigenous encampment for the unhoused. She has been charged with obstructing a police officer after she refused to comply with orders to leave the vicinity of a police action or be forcibly removed. The charge carries a maximum of two years in prison. The CAJ says Morin's arrest makes an absolute mockery of the rights to freedom of the press and the ability to report on the activities of taxpayer-funded law enforcement agencies. The first court hearing is scheduled for February 1st. In Labrador, an inquiry into Innu caught up in the child protection system wrapped up. It was looking into the treatment, experiences and outcomes of those children. Angel Moore explains what came out of the week of formal hearings. The testimony was heard in the Shesha Sheet Innu Nations Youth Centre. It focused on health and well-being, history and the impacts of child welfare in Innu communities. Jack Panache was an addictions counsellor and social health director for years in his community. He testified more supports are needed for families to prevent youth at risk. We have to stop this um, reaction of always in that mode of we, we react to crisis, we, 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 we attend to those crises right away. And I think in some ways that was the norm since um, 
since we came in Chihadid and lived all, our, all year round in Chihadid. In the 1960s, the Innu were relocated to the Sheshashi First Nation, about 40 kilometers north of Goose Bay. They originally lived on the land as nomadic hunters. The relocation led to poverty and addictions, and Innu youth taken into provincial care, some placed as far as away as the Prairie Provinces. The Innu nation demanded an inquiry, who say children in provincial care lost their language and culture, and youth died by suicide. After years of delay, the inquiry was launched in April 2022, with Commissioners James Igliorte, Mike Devine, and Anastasia Cupe. Peneshwe says land-based programs are needed. And I know utilizing and working with people on land, utilizing your own culture, your own positive things, you will get more rewards, more positive in terms of when we talk about prevention. That's the kind of services I think that are required to support and even help Inu you know, people become better. The inquiry will continue in Nat Pushish, but the next formal hearings aren't known yet. The final report must be completed by September 30th. Angel Moore, APTN National News, Jabuktuk, also known as Halifax. A nonprofit organization in Whitehorse has opened a warming center in hopes of keeping vulnerable people out of the cold this winter. Safe at Home Society will operate the center located at the former High Country Inn. It will be open to the public from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. Thursday to Sunday. Snacks and meals will be provided to those in need. Staff will also connect people with housing supports and ensure they have a safe place to go when the center closes at the end of March. Safe at Home Society Executive Director Kate Meechan says it's been slow going so far, but she's hoping getting the word out will change that. So we really just want to provide people who might be isolated or um, no place to go in and warm up because they have barriers to accessing other services, um, whether you're housed or not, if you, if you feel like you need a safe place to be, um, the warming centre could be a good option. We need to step aside for one more short break. Stick around for our photo of the day and weather. Plus an art exhibit celebrating the legacy of the late George Cludesy. That work he did to share culture and give those students a sense of pride and identity uh, really caused them to go on into um, having stronger, more important lives. Welcome back. Time now for our photo of the day. How about this sunrise from Victoria, British Columbia? Cal Carter sent in this beauty. Thanks for sharing with all of us and all our viewers. If you have a picture you would like to be featured during our newscast, send it to share at aptn.ca. Now let's take a look at tomorrow's weather forecast. Over on the east coast, minus three in sunshine for Halifax, minus five and snowy in Charlottetown. Maine, minus 10 there, Kujuak flurries and minus nine. St. Jovite, minus three in sunshine there, Montreal, minus seven. Sarnia, snowy and plus two, Sault Ste. Marie, three degrees. Capus Cason, flurries, three degrees there, Sioux Lookout, plus two. God's Lake, rainy and four degrees there, Thompson, sunshine and five degrees. Dauphin, sunny and four degrees there, Barron's River, plus two. Swift Current, 13 degrees and sunshine there, Saskatoon, sunny and plus five. Stony Rapids, rainy and four degrees there, Buffalo Narrows, plus eight. 8 degrees in rain for Peace River, Grand Prairie, and Fort McMurray. Red Deer, sunshine and 9 degrees, Medicine Hat, plus 13 in sunshine. Vancouver, rainy and 13 degrees there, Bella Coola, plus 8. Fort Nelson, rainy and 9 degrees, Smithers, sunshine, 7 degrees. Beaver Creek, snowy and minus 19 there, Mayo, minus 18. Norman Wells, minus 15 there, Fort Simpson, minus 1. Polituck snowy and minus 15, Saks Harbor, minus 27 and sunny. Baker Lake, minus 20, now yet sunshine and minus 31. Arctic Bay, minus 35 and sunshine there, Joe Haven, minus 28. An art exhibit at the Bill Reed Gallery in Vancouver has just opened, celebrating the legacy of the late George Cludesy from the New Channel Nation on the west coast of Vancouver Island. 
Cludesy was a noted activist, artist, and actor. He passed on in 1988 at the age of 83. Cludesy is recognized for preserving deep-rooted cultural traditions and customs through his artwork and activism. The exhibit features work from various indigenous artists honoring Cludesy, including archival photographs and a documentary film. He spent 10 years at residential school, but he was born to a very cultural family in Port Alberni, and he managed to retain his language and his culture. He went on after his time at residential school. He worked in, in different uh, careers, but he had, after a back injury, he ended up working as the custodian at the Alberni Indian Residential School, and, uh, and then he became a really important mentor to the young students who were still at the school. Uh, that work he did to share culture and give those students a sense of pride and identity uh, really caused them to go on into um, having stronger, more important lives. A teenage hockey player from Nipissing First Nation who's currently playing in southern Ontario has been busy trying to help his community back home. He's collecting bags of used hockey equipment and donating it all to North Face Shooting Stars Team, which is a program for people with developmental disabilities. CTV's Eric Tashner has more. 14-year-old Xavier Bocage likes to set an example both in hockey and in life. I like helping out kids, you know, just like... Being, being a leader is always amazing, you know. So he came up with an idea last year to donate some of his own used hockey gear to kids with disabilities who play the game. I was at the rink and I, I saw them playing, you know, and like I thought like maybe there's some kids that don't have equipment and like maybe I should like give back. The young defenseman rallied his friends on the team he plays for in Burlington to scrounge up more equipment and they agreed to chip in. They were like really happy to like help out. Bocage donated 14 duffel bags full of hockey equipment, sticks, pads, gloves and more to the Shooting Stars, a team in North Bay that offers a program for players with disabilities. It's amazing to see him give back to the community, give back to the to to kids that who don't really are are not really privileged to to afford uh, equipment. With autism services being cut back in funds, families have to choose lots of time between what they have available to their child. You know, we're making the door open again. The Bocage family says Xavier is guided by his team's mandate to be courteous at all times, both in hockey One. and in life and they say he's happy to do this for the shooting stars back near his hometown. He's absolutely scoring both on and off the ice. Last year, um, he, he was able to go right on the ice with them and spend a whole um, practice with them. Probably going to try to keep it up for like as long as I can. Eric Tashner, CTV News, North Bay. Awesome initiative there, Xavier. And that's all the time we have for you tonight here on APTN National News. For news anytime, visit our website at aptnnews.ca. I'm Savannah Kelly, Marcy Miigwich. Thank you for joining us tonight. Take care and have a great night.